Okay, the first step here is to proof of concept this this shit. That means installing everything. It means getting shit on the screen. It means getting the shit on the screen to update every frame. It means getting the shit that's updating every frame that can be controlled from the contents of some Rust thing, uh, like a byte array or something. And then get the shit updating on the screen every frame that's controlled from Rust working at 60 FPS on an iPhone and on desktop. But first, just so you all know, we're going to make a Game Boy emulator and learn Rust and WebAssembly in the process. You should go watch the first intro video if you haven't. There's a link here. And you should sub and thumbs up and follow me on Twitter and GitHub and all the places. Okay, I need to revise the plan that we made in the last episode. Unfortunately, after screen recording about 15 hours of coding, I realized that the footage is unusable. So the new plan is I'm going to catch you all up with the current state of the code base before making any more progress on the code. And then we'll code until something interesting happens or a certain number of hours passes, and then I'll mine for something interesting in the editing and then make the next video. What you're seeing here is at 60 frames per second, a canvas that is 160 by 144 pixels. The pixels are upscaled and every single pixel is updated every single frame. Let's dive deeper into this. The tech stack here, we have at the base a browser. Then on top of this, we have WebAssembly and, you know, HTML, I guess. Then we have Rust. And then there's this library in Rust called WebSys and my code. And what does my code do? Let's say for a second that we had a magic byte array or vacuate. For those that are new to Rust, a vec is just a contiguous growable array type. Pretend we have a grid, and this grid is 160 by 144, so 160 pixels across and 144 pixels down. That happens to be the exact resolution of a Game Boy screen. And what we can do is build this vector up in such a way that uh, each line is 160 times four spots wide, and there's 144 rows. So the total size is 144 times 160 times four we can represent one pixel of the Game Boy from the point of view of Canvas, from the point of view of the browser, as a group of four bytes, R, G, B, and A. We can say R, G, and B, uh, we can set those as required for a Game Boy. A, you know, the, the Game Boy doesn't have any sort of transparency, so that's always going to be 255. But if we do that, then we can address specific pixels by doing row times width times four plus the current column times four. We offset that plus zero, plus one, plus two, plus three to access R, G, B, and A respectively. Before I show you the code, I have to go over the tech stack I set up for recording terminal sessions. This shit is sick. I spent a ton of time on this and you're gonna have to hear me talk about it. So there's this thing, Askinema. It's great. Uh, it's a program that you can get and it has a web-based player. It records terminal sessions in uh, a very concise format. What I do is I play back the Askinema footage in their built-in player, but not directly. First, I have to open the browser console, change some CSS to get a theme to match my environment theme to, to get an aesthetic that I want. Then I zoom a bit in the browser because the Askinema playback viewer has vector rendering. So if we zoom first before we record, then I don't have to zoom the recording and, and you get a fuzzy playback. So we zoom in the browser. And not only that, but a schema has options for playing back terminal footage at different speeds. So I can play back an editing session where I spend hours editing at super high speeds before I actually do the actual MP4 screen recording on top of it, which means I can deliver to you 60 FPS sessions without having to record at thousands of frames per second originally. And what you're seeing now is one such high-speed playback session of me cleaning up the code that I'm about to talk about more uh, before I talk about it. If you're looking at this, it's not a good size for our videos, especially for our mobile viewers, but this is the size of the terminal that I need to use to be productive. After I do my editing, I can drop down to an optimized sized terminal that I set up before to do the explaining. And now we can go into that view and explain the code implementing the bridge 
between an ever-changing byte array in Rust and the canvas in the browser. We're going to open and mostly stay within the lib.rs file. We'll start at the JavaScript entry point, which is the function in the Rust file denoted with the wasm bind gen start macro. Macros in Rust are lines that start with a hash and then have square brackets. First, we run a bunch of code that sets up better error messages if we crash. I should say that most of the code we're going over today, I cobbled together from various Rust and WebAssembly tutorials. It seems like Alex Crichton is responsible for writing the majority of these, so thank you, Alex. And fun fact, Alex was my TA in compilers class in school. Now we can jump into the web utils module where we have a big extern C declaration at the top. What's cool about this is with the help of these macros, we can bind directly to JavaScript. Here we can say console log is this log function and performance.now is this performance now function. Now we move into the first bit of code that uses websys bindings. Websys is a crate, that means it's an external library. This one is auto-generated from web IDL descriptions of all the APIs in JavaScript. It's a way to access DOM APIs from Rust. Here, we're using websys to get the window, the global window and scope, and we're unwrapping unsafely the result, and we're gonna fail with that error message if missing. This one says, if you give me a JavaScript closure of a function, that you want to run on every request animation frame, then I will call request animation frame for you with that closure. Finally, this one is very similar to the window function. We're just grabbing the document off of the window. At this point, we use websys to let us write JavaScript in Rust. First, we're doing get element by ID, then we're casting it to a canvas, then we're grabbing the width and height, and then we're grabbing the 2D context from the canvas. We can use RC RefCell to opt out of the static lifetime checking in Rust and instead have some of that memory safety at runtime. We do this because request animation frame has a weird way of calling itself. This vector, which is initialized to zero, holds the four bytes per pixel video data that we're gonna to use to display in the canvas. Now we're entering the loop that runs every frame. One thing that we do is we keep track of the time difference between the last time this request animation frame callback was invoked. In order to actually draw something, we need to modify this byte vector. Here, we're setting everything to gray. That is RGB is the same color. A is 255, that means it's fully opaque. We're making this gray color change, and that's why we're including I in this calculation. I is a value that increments every frame, and it's a nice diagonal pattern if we include row and call in the calculation. Then we write some JavaScript to blit the bytes from our Rust byte vector into the canvas. We use more Rust JavaScript to display an FPS counter using the time delta that we calculated earlier. After we increment i, we call request animation frame again so that we can run this code again on the next frame. And outside the request animation frame closure, we call request animation frame so that we can start this whole loop the first time. That's about three hours of coding that took maybe 20 hours to video edit. <laughs> um, this is really, really hard for me to edit. Uh, hopefully I'll get better in future videos. If you think I could improve any part of this, let me know. What did we cover today? We explained this tech stack with, with the browser at the bottom, then HTML, WebAssembly, Rust, and WebSys, and then the Game Boy code. We talked about how the browser APIs allow us to represent pixels of our canvas at high frame rates both in the abstract and in our actual code. I also talked about the tech stack for recording these terminal sessions because it's interesting. Yeah, I'll see you next time.